studio with a house full right now. I've got the mogul Mike Hornby here as in delegate. Thank you for having me, Rob. As an owner. As in uh, payroll provider. Payroll tomorrow. provider. <laughs> also, uh, Matt, I admit now it's a Fedora Harvey. Yes. Thank yes. you, Chris, and, uh, for stating that out and backing I'm, me up. I'm going to wear it. Uh, William Whittington even posted the definition of what makes a fedora a fedora. So I was wrong. guilty I was on all wrong. counts. And the wide brim fedora is in right now, so you're actually making a fashion statement. You I look don't good. Know what Just the statement is? Put the coat on too. Show them the whole ensemble, man. It's a great look. <laughs> you look like a detective. And, and Chris Cernock has five thousand hats <laughs> in his basement, uh, and and he he doubled down on it and said he's he's not kidding. Now change yeah. that H to a C, you know and we've what? got a psychological problem. If you just change that one letter from <laughs> hats to cats. You know what Chris ought to do? He ought to bring his top ten tomorrow here. Yes, for the open house. For an open house. Open house between be eleven good. and one yep. tomorrow, and the boss's wife is cooking. I understand. Uh, I think she's. Providing all the goodies and stuff for everybody so that everybody can come kiss Bill Stubblefield's ring. You're in for a treat. Via telephone, Attorney General Patrick Morrissey. Patrick, good morning to you once again. Hey, good morning. It's been a long time, fellas. <laughs> <laughs> Whole hours. <laughs> hey, uh, what, what is, uh, what's your Christmas break going to be like this year, Patrick? You know, we're going to be working through uh, probably until about the, the 22nd or so, and then... Uh, you know, obviously, we'll try to get together the family for Christmas and relax. Uh, but uh, then, you know, I think I'll be splitting time. I'll be up in the Panhandle a little bit uh, between Christmas and New Year's and uh, maybe be in Charleston. Uh, but it's uh, think pretty fairly low-key this year, just a lot of work going on. But a little bit of relaxation, and uh, I'm sure it's going to be a lot of fun time with family and friends, and that's good. Do you own a fedora? I do not. Oh, we know it to get now Patrick for Christmas now. That's the heart of, of, of my success. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh wait, wait, that, here comes the Christmas gift. I can see it in the mail. Uh, Patrick, let's talk about the judge's ruling yesterday in regards to the eligibility issues with undergraduate ath- uh, student athletes who have transferred once already and their ability to transfer a second time. Yes. So yesterday was a really important hearing in the Northern District of West Virginia. The judge uh, issued a temporary restraining order on the NCAA to enforce their transfer eligibility rule. And they ended up uh, providing a 14-day period uh, where athletes who have transferred uh, twice and who were asked to sit out for a year in NCAA competition are going to be allowed to play. Uh, We believe at least for this 14-day period, but that could stretch on much longer uh, because we will have another hearing on December 27th to see if we can extend that to a permanent injunction. And the value of this hearing is that it sets aside the NCAA rule, which really has been holding athletes back. We had argued that this transfer rule was hurting athletes in a couple ways, really discouraging them from transferring to schools that had the best academic, athletic, and cultural fits for them. And it actually artificially disadvantaged these, sec- these two-time transfers. There were different rules in place for them, forcing them to sit out for a year. And we think that ended up deflating their value, their ability to participate in sports. And when you're, ca- when you're talking about federal antitrust law and you're talking about restraining an athlete ability to perform and then ultimately to make money that's a problem and that's not going to be consistent with antitrust law so uh, we think that the court is hearing these issues clearly and favorably and this really came up because there's an athlete that had transferred to west virginia by the name of raekwon battle who had previously been in washington state and i'm sorry washington state in the University of Washington had been in Montana State and then transferred to WVU. This is an individual who grew up in an Indian reservation, has indicated that he's had some real challenges. He has a really an amazing personal story in terms of family members who uh, were killed and uh, real struggles growing up. And Matt, basketball really was his salvation. And the NCAA rejected his waiver to play this year and we wrote a letter we weighed in pretty hard 
And then ultimately, a group of seven states, including West Virginia, went in to sue the NCAA. And in part, it's because of, <coughs> excuse me, Raekwon's circumstances that we tried to challenge this rule. And so far, round one goes to the good guys. You mentioned the ability to make money which was not on the radar screen for athletes a couple of years ago. Did that ability perhaps make this ruling more favorable than it might have been previously had athletes not had the whole NIL approval that they have now? Yeah, look, I I think in some respects it it helps strengthen the case to challenge this on antitrust grounds because not only are they being kept off the court uh, for a year arbitrarily, something that doesn't meet normal legal standards, I think it hurts their financial well-being, so I believe that it does, because you're right, NIL was not on the scene a few years ago, so I think that the uh, harming of the athletes gets even uh, worse when it comes to uh, NIL. What are you expecting will happen in two weeks, Patrick? (laughs) You know, uh, it's round one, so I think that that's a, a very good sign. You have to show that you're very likely to succeed on the merits to get a Temporary restraining order is not an easy thing, so it's certainly very positive. Uh, We will humbly go to the court, and we will ask to make that a permanent injunction. It's important to note that the judge really ruled on the seven-state effort led by Ohio, and it's a bipartisan initiative, and they ruled on that. Uh, They did not really address the unique issues of Raekwon, even though Raekwon's attorney they also sued, uh, but I think that they, the court did not feel like it had all of the facts pertaining to Raekwon to rule on them. But notwithstanding that, uh, because we were able to prevail in the bigger picture, that obviously provided the relief for Raekwon. So, look, I expect that we're going to see Raekwon and maybe even uh, Farrakhan uh, participate uh, in basketball games. That's my expectation. Uh, I don't make those calls. Obviously, the decision should be made for the best interest of the student athlete. And I think, though, there should be less concern about playing these kids now in light of the TRO, at least for this 14-day period. And then we'll get December 27th. We'll make the additional arguments and hopefully get a more permanent solution. Matt Harvey. Good morning, Patrick. Um, let, let's say that, that they dissolve the TRO on the December 27th hearing. Does that have any impact to the Mountaineer program or to Raekwon Battle's future uh, eligibility to play basketball? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, in the order, we had actually raised this point. We were very worried about the NCAA retaliating against the school and the athletes. Uh, even though we won at the TRO stage, right? Because if you go out and play in the past, the NCAA had really said you play at your own risk. That if it gets changed, that let's say the WV goes on to win the Big 12 or makes it to the Final Four, uh, NCAA could say we're going to vacate all those victories. And so we were sensitive to that and raised those issues. And the court, I think, has been pretty clear that there should be no retaliation under the so-called restitution rule, this forfeit rule of your of your wins. So I think that it, the message of the court is clear, that for these 14 days, these athletes are going to have the ability to play uh, for their schools, and it's going to be relatively risk-free, at least for those 14 days. Now, it's my understanding that different schools may be handling it different ways, but I think the message of the court is pretty clear, and it's hard to see a scenario, even if you saw a reversal of the TRO, that there would be a real penalty on WVO, WVU or on Raekwon Battle. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I think it's highly, highly unlikely, and that's where we are right now. I think yesterday's result was very positive, and while it doesn't guarantee uh, the bright future, it takes a big step forward. What happens after December 27th? This That cannot be the end of this case. No, I, I think, number one, you're going to see uh, the NCAA, uh, they're, going, they're obviously reevaluating the whole 
transfer eligibility rule. I think that there's no way that that stays. Look, that's a rule that should go into the scrap heaps. I mean, it's a terrible rule. And I think the one thing that came out yesterday is that when they were interviewing the athletes, Raekwon actually testified at the hearing yesterday. But their witness uh, examination was very skeptical about why athletes needed to play now. And it was almost as if they're insisting that Raekwon had to wait. And in the past, the NCAA has received a lot of this deferential treatment by the courts. But I think we're seeing that coming to an end and that when these rules don't come up, the courts are going to toss them out. And that's not good for the NCAA, but it's certainly good for student athletes, which is good. So, look, uh, no guarantee, but I've always predicted, I thought that we were absolutely correct to file the suit. We were absolutely right on the law. This is violative of federal antitrust law. It's an anti-poaching rule that they're setting up, and they don't have the ability to do that. So I think that ultimately this is going to fall in the courts. I don't know that I can tell you what the replacement policy is going to look like, uh, but the NCAA uh, really should start getting back to putting student athletes first instead of uh, these arbitrary rules. Couldn't the colleges, or excuse me, the universities just pull out of membership of the NCAA and, and create something different? I don't know that they're going to pull out, and I, I, I'm not ready to go that far yet in terms of what will happen, but uh, what it does say, and I think which is very true, is that the NCAA, nor any individual, you've got to comply with the laws, period. And that's part of the reason why we went in and we partnered with seven states. We thought that the NCAA was uh, I, I think seemingly so big for their own britches uh, that they've been operating uh, in a way that really had been disrespectful to these athletes' interests and their desire to play. And why should student-athletes be treated worse than coaches and treated worse than student musicians? I mean, think about this for a moment. What if we extended the same policy to someone in a band and they want to transfer, and you say, no, you can't participate in the band. Let's say you want to go from Ohio State to WVU and play in the band say, no, you have to wait a year because it's better for your academics to wait a year. You would say that this is absurd. Uh, and in fact, there is no policy on people in the band waiting. However, if you're a student athlete, you have to wait a year. Why? Well, there are many better ways to tailor this rule, to draft it. Uh, if you're a coach, you could uh, be fired. You could leave midway through a season. There's no restraint of trade there, but there is a restraint of trade on these athletes, and that's what causes them problems under the law. That's why I think this this rule is going to uh, not survive this process. I think we should apply all of this to the WVSSAC as well and uh, go about this at the local level too. Patrick, I appreciate your time this morning. Thank you very much. Yes, look, it's a fascinating case, uh, but the AGs get involved because it – uh, incorporates rule of law and trust uh, concerns and I'm pleased with round one uh, go Raekwon and now WVU tell you what their lineup's going to look a lot different coming up this weekend and uh, we'll determine in two weeks whether that continues into March thanks buddy appreciate yep. it alright guys take care